up, I call out a walk. I pray this devil died uh, and get every evil thing the Lord got to get. And listen, I know you look at us in the state we in right now. Come your child. Come your child. Come your child. I know you look at us in the state we in right now. Black people on drugs and we suffering and dying. And I know it seems like you can do whatever you want to this people. I know it seems like this, but the time for glorifying yourself is soon at an end. All right. Come on, sis. What was the um, next other story you heard? That they came here and that uh, the Indians created a big feast to welcome them to the land. Okay, so the white man came, Indian song was happy. Hey, it's white people, pale faces. Let's have a feast. So they all sat down and ate, and it was wonderful. Right. What else? And is that, is that all that you is that all that you was taught? Or what did the you gym, remember? That was the gist of it. That was yeah. just up. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else had a different Thanksgiving story? Officer Marat. Uh, it, it's the same, but they, they, uh, I forgot. I, it was something else. It was along the same lines. Like they, had, they gave them land or something. I know. I know that it was like something after the feast they did too. Okay. Okay. So they had a feast. Everybody sat down. Everybody ate. Wonderful and amazing and fantastic, right? That sounds like what everybody else knew. Okay, then anybody remember the Disney movie? No, there was no Disney movie about Thanksgiving. I'm thinking about something else. So everybody, that's the history of Thanksgiving, right? White people came, Native Indians met them. Hey, white people, let's have a feast. Celebrate the welcoming of these pale-faced people we never seen before. Everybody sat down, ate, and it was wonderful. So today in America. On the third Thursday of the month of November, America stops and has a Thanksgiving celebration. What do they tell you? Why do they tell you it's important for you to celebrate Thanksgiving? Why in America do they say it's important for you to stop and give thanks? Now we all know the story of the Indians and the pilgrims, right? Are we Indians? Are we pilgrims? So why the hell did we grow up celebrating Thanksgiving? Anybody know? Give it And your family, why did y'all celebrate Thanksgiving? Anybody grow up not celebrating Thanksgiving? Well, yes, but. So y'all didn't celebrate Thanksgiving. So while everybody else was sitting around having turkey and stuffing and cranberry sauce, what were y'all doing? It's regular Thursday when we was working. It's regular Thursday y'all was working. So y'all been getting that double time uh, on Thanksgiving, huh? Yeah, I, that's what's up. I ain't going like that. But. <laughs> Yeah, but now, but now, hey, everybody now, see, that's extra money Thursday for Thanksgiving. It ain't nothing special, but that's, y'all had it good coming up. Come on, sis. Basically, it's because it's a good Christian thing to do. It's a good Christian thing to do. <laughs> what about anybody else? Why, why would you celebrate Thanksgiving? Why did your family get together on Thanksgiving? Oh, it was enough. It was a time where everybody got together. It was like a holiday type thing where everybody came together and ate macaroni and cheese. <laughs> okay, everybody ate macaroni and cheese. Sis. Tradition. Tradition. That's why. A lot of our families, Thanksgiving was just something you did. Something you did because everybody else did. You know what I mean? I remember growing up, there were three times a year we had turkey, stuffed turkey. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. Those are the three times you had turkey with stuffing and gravy and roast beef and mashed potatoes, and macaroni and cheese, and glazed ham. <laughs> and that was because it was the thing to do. Just get around the table, we'd hold hands and everyone say our grace and say what you're thankful for. And Thanksgiving was just a time to, you know, be happy about life no matter what was going on. Ignoring, you know, my crackhead aunt, ignoring, you know, uh, you know, the the, uh, the brother, the cousin that was going to jail, or the arguments and the fights that would happen. We ignored all of that during Thanksgiving. All of that went aside, and we all got together and smiled and kissed and hugged and thanked the Lord because it was Thanksgiving. It was just what we did. Same went for Christmas. Same went for Easter. All right. A lot of these things that we are, have become accustomed to doing in the black community is because of tradition. Like your sister said, it's just something that we do. 
But now that we are in the truth, what is the first thing you learn when you come into the truth? Officer Murrah. That ain't the first thing you learn. When they, for all of you all, when you first heard about the ISUPK, what was the first thing you heard us say? Sis. Yeah, okay, that's one of the that's one of the things. What is the thing? Okay, you may have heard that the first. It might have been the first thing you heard. What is the thing that sticks out in your mind that you hear us say when you first find out about the ISUPK or Hebrew Israelites? Mara. That's one. That ain't the main. That's not the controversial thing. What is the thing that make most people be like, damn? Officer, no. The white man is the devil that the Bible speaks of. <laughs> the white man is the devil that the Bible speaks of. Why do we say the white man is the devil? Is it because of his blue eyes? It's because of his pale skin? Why do we say the white man is the devil, sis? Because he's sneaking in on the head. Okay, that's that's a good, that's close. It was, why don't we say it, sis? He's deceitful. He's deceitful. The word devil means deceiver or liar. The white man is the liar. He's lied about everything. Everything you ever were taught growing up in America that you thought was true, that you learned from white people, was a lie. The story of Thanksgiving is a goddamn lie. There was never a time when the white man came over here Got off on boats and the Indians was like, hey, pale faced people, let's have a feast and a celebration and let's all eat. All right, I'm going to read an article about the real history of Thanksgiving. There's a reason why Thanksgiving is celebrated on the third Thursday of the month of November every year. And we're going to read about why they had Thanksgiving celebrations, what was the purpose, what was the reason that the uh, white man was celebrating. And then you'll see that what you've been taught about Thanksgiving and about why America celebrates this day is a lie. Everybody understand? So I'm reading here. I got. I'm gonna put up for everybody that's um. Come on, with, you gonna say something? I'm gonna read it. For, I'm gonna pull it up for everybody that uh may be watching this tape later. I'm gonna pull it up on the screen so that you can see it and read it. All right. Um. Also, not if you could let me get the HDMI cord so everybody in the room can see the see what I pull up. All right. This is a website. It's um, it's a Native Indian website. It has a lot of different articles, stories about Native American Indian history. This particular article is about the real story of Thanksgiving. All right. So I'm gonna read it here now. Pull it up so all, that you, you all can see it. Everybody can see that, right? You might not be able to see it, see it all all the words, but you can see y'all see the screen, the globe in the way. Oh, it's not. Bible shop, you can move the globe. All right, now I'm going to be skipping through some of it just for time's sake. All right, and I'm going to read this and we're going to get into some scriptures on it. It says, The Real History of Thanksgiving by Susan Bates. Most of us associate the holiday with happy pilgrims and Indians sitting down to a big feast. That sounds familiar, right? And that did happen once. The story began in 1614 when a band of English explorers sailed home to England with a ship full of Patuxent Indians bound for slavery and they ain't never told you that part did they? Yeah. 1614 the europeans when they first came to america the first thing the white man did was enslave the native indians everywhere in america where the white man encountered native indians there was no smiling no happiness no peace it was the white man coming to murder rape kill and take the land all right so in 1614 some english explorers came and captured a village of native indians put them in the bottom of their ships and was sailing them back to England to sell as slaves. It said they left behind smallpox, which virtually wiped out those who had escaped. So the native Indians that escaped the slavery, they died because of the disease the white man left behind. By the time the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts Bay, they found only one living Patuxent Indian. So when the white man came back to that land, they only found one living Native American Indian man. Um, a man named Squanto who had survived slavery in England and knew their language. Now, Squanto was the only native Indian that was left alive when the white man came back. How did Squanto know how to speak English? How did Squanto get a built up immune system to not die from the white man's diseases? Or was it not? What do you mean? He went with him to, uh, to Europe. How did he go with him? As a traitor. No, 
of the Marab. So he, like he was he went there as a child. Why would a native Indian child go to go to Europe? Go to England. How could he speak how could he speak English? He was a slave. This native Indian boy that the white man found when they came back had already been a slave in Europe. He was a slave in England, came back, got on a boat coming back to America. When he came back, he found his village gone, found his people gone. Then another group of white people from England came and they found him. So we're going to read about what happened next with Squanto. It says, he taught them to grow corn and to fish and negotiated a peace treaty between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag nation. At the end of their first year, the pilgrims held a great feast honoring Squanto and the Wampanoags. Now, come on, sis. Um, they were in the Northeast. I can't say they were specifically only in Virginia. You have to understand at that time, there were no borders. So Native Indians traveled. Could have been some Wampanoags in Virginia. It could have been in Maryland. Could have been in, in Delaware, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. They could have been up and down the East Coast, right? So if you've heard of Wampanoag Indians in Virginia, yeah, they was in Virginia as well. You gonna say something? They have reservation in Northern Virginia. Okay, so they, they have a reservation. Now, you know, that reservation possibly is not where you were originally. That reservation is where the white man pushed them to because that was land that the white man didn't want. So wherever they are in Northern Virginia, it's probably the horriblest piece of land to grow crops and to farm and to raise cattle that exist on the planet. Because when the white man took the land from the Native Indians, he pushed them to the parts that he did not want. Like right now, there's big reservations in Oklahoma, big reservations in South Dakota, North Dakota. That land, you cannot grow crops on. That land, you cannot farm and raise corn and raise cotton and different crops, which is why the white man took Alabama. He took Mississippi. He took Louisiana. He took South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, because that's where the Native Indians lived, because that's where the good land was. So anywhere Native Indians are today is where the white man pushed them to. But it's good to know that there is, a, there is a reservation in Northern Virginia, right? So these Wampanoag Indians, through Squanto, made a deal with the white man. If Squanto was a native Indian who had gone into slavery, went to Europe, learned the white man language, came home, saw how his people were destroyed, why would Squanto then help the white people that came and didn't know how to fish or farm or live off the land? Sis. Maybe he was thinking, if I teach them, they'll leave us be. Okay. That's that's possibly what he was thinking. That's a good thought. Um, of the Marat. Uh, uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, I, I had no idea. Maybe that's, that's okay. What was he? What, what was what was he not think? What did? Okay. What was he not think? Oh, sorry. Probably that 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 he could trust somebody. He wasn't thinking that or he was thinking that. I'm asking what 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 thought didn't come across Squanto's mind? Probably it was us. Uh, come on with it. Probably he was probably was thinking they wouldn't kill him. They wouldn't kill him they would so he, he was him. he he was trusting them or he was not trusting them. He was trusting them. He was trusting them. And he should not have trusted them. Right. He should have known that this man is the devil. And there's no good that can come from being friends with this man. But because Squanto was a slave, he thought like a slave. And how do they, slaves think? Slaves just think about surviving. If I can only live for today. You understand? Slaves also suffer from something called Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a condition where a slave has develops a love for his slave master when that slave master is no longer beating him, is no longer raping him, is no longer treating him cruelly. Squanto had Stockholm Syndrome, which is why when he came back to America and saw that his people had been destroyed, he did not think, I should never, ever join these myself to these white people. I should stay as far away from them. He thought, maybe if I help them live, they won't kill me. Maybe if I be a good slave, they'll, they'll feed me and clothe me and won't rape my people and take take over my land. You understand? He was suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, so he went and found another group of Native Indians and joined them to the white man. We're going to read about what happened next. But as word, in, as word spread in England, 
about the paradise to be found in the new world, religious zealots called Puritans began arriving by the boatload. Finding no fences around the land, they considered it to be the public domain. What does that mean? The white man came, he saw land. He saw people living on the land. But because there were no fences, he felt, well, damn, I can take the land. Everybody understand. Everybody see how the white man think. It says, joined by other British settlers, they seized the land, capturing strong young natives for slaves and killing the rest. But the Pequot nation had not agreed to the peace treaty Squanto had negotiated, and they fought back now. While these Puritans are coming over and killing the Native Indians, taking them into slavery, the Native Indians that made a treaty with the white man was not fighting back. Why? Because we're supposed to have peace. White man to come raid a village of Native Indians. The Natives will say, hey, man, what happened to our peace treaty? The white man is saying, oh, man, that was a mistake. These people didn't know. Don't fight them. Don't go to war with them. We promise there won't be no more attacks. Then the next village get raped. The Indians will say, hey, man, what's going on? We've had a peace treaty. The white man will say, oh, man, you know, that was another group of people. It was a mistake. We promise y'all it won't happen again. This was the, this was the pattern that the Native Indians went through with the white man. Making a deal, deal being broken, white man saying, I'm sorry. Making a deal, deal being broken, the white man saying, I'm sorry. Everybody understand. It says, um, but these, these, these one uh, group of Native Indians, the Pequot, or Pequot, they was like, they didn't never made a deal. So they fought back against the white man. It says, the Pequot War was one of the bloodiest Indians war, Indian wars ever felt. In 1637, near present day Groton, Connecticut, over 700 men and children of the Pocot tribe had gathered for their annual Green Corn Festival, which is our Thanksgiving festival. So today's Thanksgiving festival is loosely based on the Native Indian Harvest Festival. Everybody understand? The Harvest Festival in this fall time is right before the winter comes. You grow crops that can last you through the winter. That's where squash comes from. Corn and potatoes, all them different crops that you can grow after the summer, but before the winter starchy vegetables that are that, that you fill up off of and keep you through the winter you understand so that's what squash um give me some more pumpkins um yams corn potatoes all of them starchy type of vegetables those are grown during the harvest time before the winter everybody understand that's what and then also during the winter time is when you have a lot of stews get some beef stew get some soup you throw some potatoes in there throw some squash in there throw some different things in there that'll, that'll last you for a few days. I know my family in the wintertime, we'd make a, my grandma make a giant pot of stew that lasts about five days. That way you make one big meal, we ain't gotta eat. We ain't gotta make no more food or go grocery shopping. That's how it was back in the times before grocery stores. You know what I'm saying? Before things were refrigerated, you would gather in all the harvest for the fall to prepare for the winter. The Native Indians would have a celebration. They called it the Green Corn Festival, right? In, it says, in the pre-dawn hours, the sleeping Indians were surrounded by English and Dutch mercenaries who ordered them to come outside. Those who came out were shot or clubbed to death, while the terrified men and children who huddled inside the longhouse were burned alive. The next day, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of thanksgiving because 700 unarmed men, women, and children had been murdered. Cheered by their victory, the brave colonists and their Indian allies attacked village after village. Now you hear the words that the white man uses. They murdered 700 innocent men, women, and children who were not armed because they had gathered for a festival, gathered for a holiday celebration. The white man called it a victory and called the murderers brave. Everybody understand? You see how the white man talks about murdering people? slaughtering innocent people who are not armed he calls himself brave for doing that he calls the people who who carried out that mission um he calls it a victory and the people that carried out that mission brave right it says the brave colonists and their indian allies attacked village after village women and children over 14 were sold into slavery while the rest were murdered what does that show you that the threat was meant which is why women and anybody under 14 was sold into slavery. Why? Because you can, so you can humble a woman. You can make a woman submit. You can make her conform. You can train a child. 
He can teach a child, indoctrinate them, teach them that their family was evil, the, the, the village they came from, they were, what the white man used the word, heathens and against God. You can teach a child Christianity, but you cannot transform a grown man. You cannot take a man who was grown, you know what I'm saying, trained by his father, lived in this village his whole life. You can't take a 26-year-old man and make him become Christian. You can't humble him. There's always a chance that he will rise up against you. A white man has always known that, which is why anytime he went to take over our people, he would murder the men, rape the women, and keep the children as slaves. Everybody understand? It says, um, boats loaded with as many with as many as 500 slaves regularly left the ports of New England. Bounties were paid for Indian scouts to encourage as many deaths as possible. It says, following an especially successful raid against the Pequot in what is now Stamford, Connecticut, the churches announced a second day of Thanksgiving to celebrate their victory over the heathen savages. During the feasting, the hacked off heads of natives were kicked through the streets like soccer ball. Even the friendly Wampanoag did not escape the madness. Their chief was beheaded and his, held in, his head impaled on a pole in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where it remained on display for 24 years. And y'all hear that? White man chopped your head off, played soccer with it in the streets. Took the chief of the Indians that made a treaty with him, cut his head off and put it on a pole for, and left it there for 24 years. Why would the white man do something like that? To terrorize you. So that you know we are not a people to be reckoned with. We ain't nobody to joke around with. Everybody understand. To strike fear in your heart. It says the killings became more and more frenzied. With days of Thanksgiving feasts being held after each successful massacre. Now, George Washington finally suggested that only one day of Thanksgiving per year be set aside instead of celebrating each and every massacre. Later, Abraham Lincoln decreed Thanksgiving Day to be a legal national holiday during the Civil War. On the same day, he ordered troops to march against the starving Sioux in Minnesota. That's the true story of Thanksgiving. While everybody's sitting down, while our families sat down and giving thanks and everybody got together and forgot all the problems and the issues, that the family was having just for the sake of getting together. The white man gets together to celebrate his victory over the native Indians, to celebrate murdering and slaughtering the native Indians because why? If it wasn't for all that murdering and slaughtering, the white man wouldn't have America today. White people are truly thankful for all the murdering that their, fa that their fathers did. Because if it wasn't for all the murder and the slaughter that their fathers committed on the earth, there would be no America. Everybody understand? Now, that story is a lot different from the one that we all was told growing up. Come on, you had a question? Who was that by Susan um, Burt or Bat? Susan uh, Bates. B-A-T-E-S. Susan Bates, all right? That's who wrote this article. That is the real, and I'm going to pull the video up in a little bit. That is the real story of Thanksgiving. Where can they get a copy of that? I'll give you the website. You ain't got no computer. You had to get it on the internet. I'll try to uh, see if I can print it out for you or something. Or send you an email up. I can send you on your, you have a phone? You got one of the newer phones or an old phone? Um, I guess it's like this. Okay, you should be able to pull it up on your phone then. So I, no, my phone, I can't get the internet on my phone for some reason. I tried it. I have the YouTube and all that, but Facebook, but it won't come up. Okay, well, I, I, I'll give what you at the class on it, all right? I'll give you what you at the class on it, all right? But I'll find a way to um, get it to you somehow. Okay? Now, what's some scriptures? There's a lot that we read about in that story, right? We read about the Native Indians making treaties with the white man, making deals. We read about Squanto, who was a cat that went into slavery that tried to appease the white man. All right, let's get uh, 1 Ezra chapter 8, verse 84. That's in the Apocrypha. 1 Ezra chapter 8, verse 84. We're going to see what the Lord said now. If our people knew the Most High, if our Native Indian brothers and sisters, when the white man came here, if they were following the Lord and were following the word of the Most High, they would have known not to trust the white man. They would have been able to escape all the destruction the white man brought down on them. The reason they were not able to escape it is because our, my, our people were not obeying the Lord. 
What happened to the Native Indians, as sad as it is to read about in history, it happened because the Lord wasn't with them. The Lord wasn't with them because they were not serving the Most High. Flat out, plain and simple. Don't think the Native Indians was just, you know, living here, serving the Most High and obeying him and doing everything right. Native Indians was doing a lot of evil, worshiping false idols, smoking weed, getting high. A lot of them, they wanted to have sex with them white, uh, white men when they came over here. You understand? So there's a lot of evil that was going on with our people before the white man came, which is why the Lord fulfilled his promise he made to our people in letting us be destroyed and going to sleep. Everybody understand? Now, that doesn't change the fact that the white man is the devil and the way in which he slaughtered our people is not acceptable to the Lord. We're going to get the scriptures on that as well. Come on with it. Oh, oh, I'll let the, just, just a real, real quick. Yeah. I'll let the doctor's office they get my checkup. So I was trying to tell the sisters in there about it's a sin to celebrate Christmas, right? Man, but look. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. They, they want to throw me out, 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 out of the office. Yeah, they don't want to hear that. Oh, they ain't trying to hear that. They don't want to hear that. I think y'all believe the Bible. Yeah. Right, and I show what Isaiah 10 and 1 is. Jeremiah. Yeah, Jeremiah 10. Yeah. I showed you so, right? Yeah. Now, man, they ain't trying to hear that. Yeah, they don't they want to hear that. They ain't trying to hear that. Oh. What's sad for a lot of our people, turning to the Lord be the last thing that you do. It's like when you have no more options. Everything else is done. You done tried to do every hustle in the world. You done tried to get by with every grimy deal you got. You done tried to do everything to make it in this world. When none of that works, or when you get shot, or when you go to jail, or when the woman you love so much blow somebody else rod and you catch her in the middle of it, that be the thing that's like, I gotta find God. I can't live like this no more. I mean, I'm, personally for me, it was I, I was at that point. It was either, either I find the Lord, or I kill myself or find a reason for somebody to kill me. I was ready to be done with life. That's when you search for the Lord. You understand? So everybody, you got some young girls out here, they they getting high and hoeing and, you know, whatever's going on. They ain't trying to hear nothing about God and that celebrating Christmas. They ain't trying to hear nothing about keeping the law, statutes, and commandments and putting down the, the weed and, and the pills. Something horrible has to happen to them before they eat. Say, you know what, man, I got to look for the Lord. It's unfortunate that when that happens for a lot of our people, they go into the Christian church and the Christian pastor is waiting to molest your child or waiting to, you know, a woman that's a hoe that want to change. She go into church and become the pastor's hoe. You understand? All kinds of evil go on in Christianity that makes a person who's ready to serve the Lord just say, well, well goddamn, I, being wicked must be the thing to do. Everybody understand. But as times get worse in this place, the truth is what's going to save those brothers and sisters who are at the bottom and trying to find their way out. All right. Well, let's read first Ezra chapter 8, verse 84. See what the Lord says about joining ourselves to these other nations. What chapter? Uh, first Ezra. She's in the apocrypha. You ain't got a apocrypha yet? Okay. Wait, you, ne you was never able to get one? They said they were bringing a class where you can buy one. Okay. You, all right. No sweat. Okay. Get on top of that for me. All right. You got, do you have another one? No? Yeah, go ahead. Officer Mariah, you got a parking? Uh, uh, uh. Hey. You're like 10 bucks, yeah? Uh, 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 it's the same thing. They said it's going to bring it to class. All right, let me see. Uh, go ahead. Uh, knock, you got it? Uh, all right. Sisters, y'all got it? Yes. If one of y'all could, please read uh second Ezra. Chapter, I mean, first Ezra chapter 8, verse 84. It says, Therefore, now shall you not join your daughters unto their sons. What did the Lord say? Therefore, now shall ye not join your daughters unto their sons. The Lord said, Do not join your daughters unto their sons. What is that talking about? That's talking about interracial marriage. Letting your daughter have sex with a white man, a Chinese man, an Arab man, an African man. The Lord said, do not join your daughters unto their sons. If the Native Indians would have known this, they would not have had sex with their daughters. Everybody, they would not have given their daughters to them failed white men. All right, read on. Neither shall 
Neither should you be your son. Neither should you trying to have that girl. Them, um, women. Everybody in the thing. Read on. More over shall never seek to have peace with them. The Lord said, moreover, you should never seek to have peace with them. That's what the Most High told our people. He told us never to seek to have peace with them. We would have never sought to have peace with the white man. Men like Squanto would have never been able to convince us to make deals with them. Men like Martin Luther King would have never been able to convince us to join ourselves to the white man. Men like Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad would never, been, never have been able to convince us to join to the Muslims. Everybody understand? If we knew this Bible, if we knew the word of the Lord, we would have never tried to join ourselves to the white man. And if we would have knew the word of the Lord and never tried to join ourselves to the white man, what would we have had? Read on some more, sis. That ye may be strong and eat the good things of the land. We would have been strong had we obeyed the Lord and that joined ourselves. Everybody understand? You stay ahead. We in America today. And being blacks, Hispanics, and Native American Indians, you can see through these other nations what not seeking peace with the white man will get you. All right, we all done grown up all across this country. There's a Chinatown in every major city in America. How is the Chinese able to have Chinatown when they hate white people? When the Chinese government is communist, which is totally backwards and against everything that America stands for, why do the Chinese have Chinatown? Why do the Chinese have Koreans, I mean, have carry out stores in the ghetto. Why do the Koreans have all of the nail salons? Why the Vietnamese doing all the feet, rubbing all the feet and um, eyebrows? Because their people know not to join themselves to white people. They stay separate. And staying separate makes the white man respect you. The Lord told us that if we would have stayed separate, we would have been strong. You know why black people are so weak, why we so divided? Because we, we've joined ourselves to the white man. And in joining ourselves to the white man, all of the black men and women that are supposed to make us strong, they join, they make us weak because they give their strength to the white man. There's a brilliant black men and women in this country. Brothers that's going to college, graduating 15 years old, 4.0s, three degrees. Guess what he do? He go get a job for the white man's military. He does not come to the ghetto. He do not come to North Philly and open up a business and try to teach other brothers. He joins himself to the white man. All these black women that's is smart and intelligent and going to college and getting these degrees, they don't come back to the hood. They don't come get, they don't come, you know, teach the brothers and the sisters that didn't get to go to college. They go get them a job working for the white man in the white man's office. Everybody understand. We've given our strength over to these other nations because we did not do what the Lord said, which is to not join with them. Not seek to have peace with them. Everybody understand? Yes, sir. Uh, um, y'all see the news this morning about they've been the Channel Six been doing a thing on Chinatown, right? And um, and Chinatown been selling, you know, what they call what the raw fish? Sushi. What they call sushi. It? Sushi. Yeah. But they not selling you sushi. But they not selling you raw fish. They selling people. On compressed pig, yeah, and I, slicing it up and making it be like, yeah, it looked like it looked like a sushi. Yeah, right. I mean that's that surprising, but that's what happens when you. And I said that's tearing back to me. Yeah, but who going, who who's going to bring them up on charges? The white man? You think the white man cares that the Chinese man is serving you pork and calling it sushi? Don't nobody give a damn. You know what? We should never shop at the white. We should never eat with the Chinese. We should never eat, want to eat their sushi. And who eat raw fish anyway? Anybody ever been fishing before? Yes. You ever caught a fish yes. and cut it open? No. I never got that. You never got, you never got to cut it open and clean it? No. Fish is disgusting on the inside. Who wants to eat raw fish? Who wants to eat fish that ain't been cooked? That's white people. That's Chinese people. That's the that's people who are not civilized. Who, you, eating something raw is what you do when you have no choice. Who does that for fun? And it's expensive. You understand? If we would have kept our culture and stayed to the laws the Lord gave us, we would have never gotten ourselves involved with any of that nonsense. Everybody understand? 
Um, we can drop that scripture. Let me get um, Isaiah 55 and 20. The Bible describes the white man and his actions to a T. So anybody that try to come up against us and say a white man is not the devil, we preaching hate, or we lying on the Bible, lying on God, just tell them to show you where we lie. Show me where anything we're saying is wrong. The Bible, when it talks about the wicked, is talking about the white race on the earth. And all of, us, all of the actions of the white man throughout history can be read about in the Bible. You got it, sis? Psalms chapter 55. Yeah, Psalms. It's a lot. Psalms chapter 55, verse 20. It's a lot if I said it wrong. Yeah, Psalms chapter 55, verse 20. All right, uh, Officer Mariah, you got it? Come on, read it. Psalms chapter 55, verse 20. Psalms 55, verse 20. He had put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. What is it saying? He had put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. It says, he had put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. That's the white man. White man came over here. What did the Native Indians try to do? He tried to be at peace with the white man. They made treaties and made deals. What did the white man do? The white man put his hands against them. What does it mean to put your hands against somebody? So how we would say today is put your hands on somebody. You put your hands on somebody. Is that a good thing? No. no the white man put his hands on people who had peace with him. That's the history of the white man on this planet. You try to be at peace with him and try to appease him and go along to get along, the white man's going to murder you more. He's going to slaughter you more. That's what the white man did to the Native Indians. That's why he celebrates Thanksgiving. He celebrates Thanksgiving because people that trusted him, because people trusted him, he was able to murder them and slaughter them relentlessly. And the white man celebrates that. He celebrates his cruelty and other people's humanity. Why did the Native Indians make deals with the white man? Because they are human, because they're kind. Under normal circumstances, no, no, no person would want to see another person starve to death, right? Uh, see somebody starving, you got some food, you'll feed them normally, right? White man starves, you feed him, and he kills you because, because you're weak. White man thinks you should just let me die. He's stupid. You just let me freeze to death. You niggas is dumb. You want to feed me and I'm dying, I'm going to murder you. That's the way the white man thinks. Everybody understand? The Lord said he put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He have broken his covenant. That's right there. He have broken his deals. Does anybody know how many treaties the white man made with the Native American Indians? Oh, it's enough. 177? 177. So something to that effect. A lot of treaties. Over 150 Let's say it's 177. How many treaties did the white man break? Raise your hand. Sis. All of them. The white man broke every treaty he made with the Native American Indians. You understand? Read on. Verse 20. I mean, verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they draw swords. You hear that? The white man speaks soft, speaks sweet and kind to make you think, oh, this guy is not so bad. This guy, you know, I can, I can deal with him. We can be, you know, well, I can trust him. His words are smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. Every time the white man sat down to make a deal with the Native Indians, further destroying them is what was on his heart. Everybody understand? It says his words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. The white man put his he, he got his hand behind he he put his hand around your back with one hand, and in the other hand, he got the knife to stab you in your chest and slit your throat. You understand? His words are smooth as oil, but what he's really saying is, I'm gonna murder you. 
white man say to native indians let's make a treaty make a deal this is my land this is your land we won't cross each other's borders we'll even do deals man we'll do some trade when the time come we'll give y'all some of these cotton blankets y'all give us some of that good squash you grow native indians give the white man squash you give them blankets full of smallpox white man say this is my land over here this is your land over here a week later the white man come and invade your land that's the white man everybody understand and the lord described perfectly what it is that the so-called white man did to the native american indians come on sis so you saying you 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 heard that the white man's laws is what he learned from the native indians okay okay i can't say that there's any truth to that because a lot of what the white man put in place here in america is what he had in place in Europe. A lot of the ways that America works as far as the voting, um, as far as being a citizen, registering yourself with the government, a lot of that came from Europe. A lot of that did not come from, from the native Indians. But the white man, okay, a lot of the ways that, a lot of the freedoms that the white man made him, gave himself here in America is what he learned from the Indians. Like freedom to carry, like you read the uh, the Constitution, the freedom of speech, freedom to bear arms, freedom to protect yourself, freedom for nobody to come take what's yours. The white man learned that from how he destroyed the Native Indians, but he didn't learn it. It ain't like the Native Indians said you should put this in your law, you should have laws like this. But the white man learned. The white man saw how he destroyed the Native Indians and said, "I never want that to happen to me and my people." So, so to protect us, everybody can have guns. Because the white man told the Native Indians they couldn't have guns. You understand? The white man said to protect us, you free to say whatever you want to say. Why? Because the white man didn't let the Native Indians say whatever they wanted to say. Yeah, you understand? The white man said to protect us, everybody can practice whatever religion they want to practice. You understand? Why? Because he never let the Native Indians practice their religion. He forced Christianity on them. You understand? The white man learned by destroying the Native Indians, he learned how to protect himself. He said, I destroyed these people by doing this. I'm not going to let it happen to my people, and I'm putting these laws in place. You understand? Um, real quick, I want to read this. It's, uh, it's called an Indian Treaty and Removal Act of 1830. So this is a law that was passed by the U.S. Department of State. You know what I'm saying? If everybody know the U.S. Department of State, is the department of the government that deals with the land, deals with borders, deal with state borders, the land, things of that sort, right? The US State Department also is the one that's in charge of all of the national parks. You know what I'm saying? The National Park Service, they all are subdivisions of the US State Department. Well, there's a law that was passed in Congress in 1830. It's called the Indian Treaty and Removal Act. And it's about how the white man made it okay in his mind to break all the treaties he made with the native Indians. i'm gonna read it it says um the story of western expansion by european americans is a basic theme of the american experience but it is also a history of indian removal from their traditional lands indians lost their lands by purchase and through war disease and even extermination but many transfers of indian land were formalized by treaty so how did the white man take a lot of the native indian land making treaties with them, right? The Constitution of 1789 empowered Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Federal policy regarded each tribe as a sovereign entity capable of signing binding treaties with the U.S. government. So what that means is the white man treated every group of Native Indians like they were a, a, a country. Right, so you had the Pocock country, you had the Wapanoag country, the Sioux country, the Cherokee country. They treated every Indian tribe like a country. So that means every country was able to make its own deals. So the white man would make a deal with the Cherokees that's totally separate and different from the deal he would make with the Sioux. Everybody understand so far. It says, um, in the first 40 years of the New Republic, the United States signed multiple treaties with Indian tribes which usually followed a basic pattern. 
Here's the basic pattern of U.S. treaties with the Native Indians. The signatory tribe withdrew to a prescribed reservation, and in return, the federal government promised to provide supplies, food, and often an annuity. So the white man say, we're taking this land. You have that land. Because you're not going to fight us to have this land that we're taking, we promise to give you food, supplies. Hell, we'll even throw you some money every year. Everybody understand what the deal was. All right. It says um, in 1830, Congress chose to disregard Indian treaty guarantees when it passed the Indian Removal Act. So guess what happened? In 1830, that deal went out the window. Whatever deal the white man made with your tribe and promises he said to give you food and supplies, the white man said, what the hell with that? It just, we just ain't doing it no more. Everybody understand? This is him, this is him, um, what is saying? Broken his covenant. This is the white man breaking the covenant in the history books of the United States government. It says, um, uh, the Indian Removal Act was a bill engineered by President Andrew Jackson. If you don't know history, Andrew Jackson is the guy that's on the five dollar bill. Five dollar bill. It was twenty or the five. Thank you. Twenty. Twenty. Andrew Jackson is on the twenty. Andrew Jackson is a diabolically evil devil. He's the one that orchestrated the Trail of Tears, which was the final removal of Native Indians from the South and North to Oklahoma and um, the reservations in North and South Dakota. You understand? He was the president that was the one that said, all right, it's enough being nice to these Indians trying to be, act like we care about them. We're just going to destroy them. Everybody understand? It says, um, despite its language suggesting a voluntary and fair exchange of lands, the act opened the door for the militias of trans, Appalachian, and Southern states to simply drive the Indians across the Mississippi by force. The Indians' destination was to be an Indian territory set aside west of Iowa, Missouri and Arkansas. That's Oklahoma and North Dakota and South Dakota. Lands that the white man did not want. Everybody understand. Said the Cherokee Nation resisted, however, challenging in court the Georgia laws that restricted their freedoms on tribal lands. In its 1831 ruling on Cherokee Nation versus the state of Georgia, the Supreme Court addressed the question of whether native tribes could be treated as foreign nations. It declared that they should be counted rather as wards of the federal government. But the following year ruled that they were indeed sovereign and immune from Georgia laws. President Jackson is famous from his Seminole Wars. It's a lot. Say President Jackson famous from his Seminole Wars against the Indians in Georgia and Florida and an ardent defender of states rights nonetheless refused to heed the court's decision. He obtained the signature of a Cherokee chief agreeing to relocation in the Treaty of Newt and Cola, which Congress ratified against the protests of Daniel Webster and Henry Clay in 1837. The Cherokee signing party did not represent the vast majority of Cherokees. So what did the white man do? He got one Cherokee to sell out. One chief to sell out probably promised them, you know, white holes and, you know, I don't know, whatever. We promised them something. He got one Cherokee chief to sell out. And that one chief selling out and signing a treaty is what made the white man feel like, okay, now I can murder these people. Now I can slaughter them and forcibly remove them off their lands, even though Congress had ruled something different. There's also a lesson to learn in this. You don't have no power without the law. White man has a system set up with laws and government and courts, but if the Lord ain't on your side, none of that means nothing. You can go to court and have the best case, best defense. Everything you're saying is right with the law, and everything you're saying, nobody can disagree with. And the white man will say, we just don't want you to win the case. To hell what you're saying. And what you're going to do? Where's your army? Where's your military? Who's going to stand for your rights? Nobody. Don't put your trust in the white man and his system. This system was not designed for you. It was designed for the white man now. Does that mean you can't win in that system? You can win if the Lord is with you. We win all the time. We go out on the street, tell the white man he's the devil, and one day men and women who serve the Lord are going to be happy to take little white babies and smash their heads on the ground. I know because I said it last week. I'm going to say it tomorrow. And white people cannot do nothing. Why? Because the Lord is with us. 
Not because I'm special or I'm great, because the Lord is great. Everybody understand. Don't trust the white man. Trust the Lord. The Lord could have, a, you could be in the court and have a case that it's impossible for you to win. You just know that there's no defense, nothing for you to say, nothing the lawyer can say to help you win, but the Lord will have you win. Everybody understand. You trust the Lord, he can deliver you, but without the Lord, use up the creek without a paddle. And that's what happened to the native Indians. Everybody understand. I'll read a little bit more. It says, um, it says, uh, when followers of Principal Chief John Ross tried desperately to hold on to their land, Jackson ordered military action in 1838. Under the guns of federal troops and Georgia state militia, the Cherokee tribe made their trek to the dry plains across the Mississippi. Why they call them the dry plains? Because there's no food can grow in that land. That land is not fertile. That land is not good. Thousands died en route from the brutal conditions of the Trail of Tears. The U.S. government's inability and unwillingness to abide by its treaty obligations with the Indian tribes was clearly related to an insatiable demand for cheap land for European settlers. Everybody understand that. Why did the white man do this to the Native Indians? Because he's the devil and he wanted everything that the Native Indians had. Everybody understand. Let me get um, Genesis 49 and 11. We're going to talk about the prophecy of the Lord on the Native American Indians, the tribe of Gad. All right. Should be Genesis uh, 49 and 19. It's locked. Genesis 49 and 19. It's locked. Um, officer not. You can get me. Uh, I need the speaker. But I need the cord to be able to reach so I can plug it in. Uh, I don't know how we're going to work this, but we got to work it. Matter of fact, no, we got a long cord. We got a long cord now. Hand me the cord from the speaker. In the front, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. All right, who got Genesis 49 and 19 for me? Sis, come on, you can read it. Get him. Gad, a troop shall overcome him. What is a troop? Soldiers, right? What soldiers? Or how did this? How was this prophecy fulfilled? The Lord said, "Gad, a troop shall overcome him." Right? What troop overcame Gad? Officer Mara. The white. The white man. Give me the name of the troop. You know, brother. United States Army. Cal United States Cavalry. The United States Army, that's who overcame the Native Indians. The cavalry led by Andrew Jackson destroyed the Native Indians, wiped them out for good, took them off of their homeland, made it so that they never could come back. You understand? The prophecy on Gad was fulfilled with the Indian Treaty and Removal Act of 1830. That's why the white man celebrates Thanksgiving. Everybody understand? The white man, in, in, in white households, they know this history. White people are not uh, white people are not ignorant to how their people gain this land. It's told in white families all this history that we learn and just now coming into the truth. But the white man is well aware of what it takes to own a nation. The white man is well aware of what the sacrifices that need to be made so that you can have a land to call your own. And the white man throughout history has been willing to make whatever sacrifices needed to be made. If it meant wiping out an entire race of people, the white man has been willing to do it to have something to call his own. All the Lord wants us to do is to stop smoking weed. Stop celebrating Christmas. Stop being hoes and faggots and doing evil. That's all the Lord wants from us. Is it too much to ask for us to have a kingdom, to have a land of our own, to have something to say we be that belongs to us? No, the Lord don't ask for too much. He's asking for very simple things. The white man had to murder and slaughter and kill and rape and lie in order to have power. The Lord just wants you to obey his laws. And it's a very small thing. Everybody understand. But let never let yourself forget what it took for the white man to have power. You understand? When his white people celebrate their holidays, they are the reason why the white man is so serious about all of his holidays is because he knows that his forefathers murdered and slaughtered and killed, and it was hard work for him to be able to be thankful. 
So the white man is thankful on, on Thanksgiving. He's thankful for all of this crime that was committed in the name of him being able to get high and, you know, hold elections, hold a presidential election. All the things the white man is able to do, it is only possible because his forefathers murdered and raped and slaughtered. Everybody understand? We could drop Genesis 49. Let me get, um, oh man, this is in my hand. Oh, that's what it is. Um, get me uh, Psalm chapter 10, verse 5. Get Psalm chapter 10, verse 5. Also, Acts, not Acts, also Amos chapter 5, verse uh, 21. We get uh, Psalms 10 and 5 first. The white man is, you know, the white man is extremely prideful. Thanksgiving, knowing the history of Thanksgiving, you would think it's something that the white man would sweep under the table, right? You would think Thanksgiving would be something that white people would celebrate in a hush, quietly. But no, they make Thanksgiving something that's the world to, to remember. Why? Why does the white man openly celebrate the murder and the slaughter of the Native American Indians? What does it tell you about the white man? Sit. No, it's a sister. I look at it as basically they're um, trying to re remind us how treacherous and evil they can be. You're right. You're right. So what's in his mind that makes him want to remind us of that? How does he feel about himself? He, he celebrates Thanksgiving and makes it the most famous holiday <laughs> because he wants us to remember how he murdered and slaughtered and was evil against us. What's in his mind, though? Same sister. Basically, he's, he's proud of it. He's <laughs> proud of it. Get a sister a hand. The white man is prideful. He's full of pride. Pride to the point where, you know, he does things that are, how can I put it? Well, I'm going to let the Lord speak because he said better than I can say it. He's, boast, he's boastful. You understand? Let's read Psalms chapter 10, verse 5. Oh, it's a knock. You can read it. Psalm chapter 10, verse 5. His ways are always grievous. His ways are always grievous. All the ways of the white man are grievous. His holidays, the laws he passes, the system he has set up, everything about being in America under the white man is grievous. What does that mean? What does the word grievous mean? I mean, it's hard. It's difficult. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's oppressive. All the white man's ways are oppressive. You understand the truth about the history of this earth and about the Bible. Everything the white man does is grievous. Christmas is grievous. You understand? Thanksgiving is grievous. Um, you know, Valentine's Day, every holiday the white man celebrates is about making you poor and celebrating something that destroys you. Christmas makes you poor. And the white man celebrates Christmas because he has triumphed in lying about Christ. Christmas is a lie about Jesus Christ. First, they say Jesus was a white man. They said his mother never had sex. <laughs> then they say Santa Claus came, come down the chimney and give you presents. Which for a black person puts pressure on you to go buy presents for everybody you know. If you're a single man or you're dating, all them hoes got to get a gift. You understand? You got to worship white Jesus. You got to teach your family that, you know, baby Jesus was white and Mary was white and never had sex. Then you got to tell them lies about Santa Claus and you don't even, you a parent, you don't even get credit for all the money you spend buying your kids gifts. You go broke every year. It's grievous. You understand? Thanksgiving is a celebration about murdering the Native American Indians, which is if you're a black person, how the hell do you celebrate that, knowing that you were destroyed next? A white man wiped out the Native Indians, and when there were no more Native Indians, they needed somebody to be slaves. Then they wouldn't get you. How could you celebrate Thanksgiving being black? You understand? How could you call yourself an American, knowing the history of what these people have done to your ancestors, knowing how you came here? Black people didn't come to America 
you know, um, by migrating. They didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, man, this African shit ain't working no more. We're going to go over there to that new land that flow with milk and honey and make a way for ourselves. That ain't what we did. We didn't come to America and see the Statue of Liberty and be like, oh, the Statue of Liberty. Nah, that's white people's story. Your story was the bottom of a ship dying with doo-doo and blood and nastiness all over you, then being put on an auction block and sold to work forever for some devil, have your name beat out of you. They make movies about it. Uh, you know, all them horrible-ass movies. Growing up, I don't know how y'all did it, man. Some older generations, y'all had to deal with roots and, you know, the color purple. Movies like that make my blood curdle. I, I watched them thing. I watched the man. I watched, you know, Roots is like, how the hell you live through that and be black and still like America? How do you do that? How do you watch Roots and be happy your name is Timothy or some shit like that? Would, it just make me sick. You understand? But the white man does all of those things because his ways are grievous. Everybody understand? Read on. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. And the white man never thinks for a second that God is going to punish him. He never thinks about the judgment for all of the evil that he's done. White man don't think about that. You know what the white man thinks about? 20 years from now, my <coughs> grandchildren are going to inherit this. You understand? Them white men that did all of this murdering in the 1600s, you know what they did it for? They did all that murdering so that in 2015, niggas would be their slaves. And then you got to think about the thought process like being black in america or being hispanic native american indian never being from a nation that doesn't have land and and resources and riches you don't know what it means to plan for future generations these white people that murdered in the 1600s were, were planning for 400 years later they murdered because they thought 400 years from now my great 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 grandchildren are going to have this land and there's white people who have land today, who have it because in 1624, their great, 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 great grandfather murdered somebody. That's how white people think. Now, imagine if we started to think like that. Imagine if black people in the ghetto didn't just think about next week, didn't just think about tomorrow, didn't think about the club on Tuesday. Imagine if we thought about 400 years from now. What would we be willing to do right now so that 400 years from now, our great, 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 great grandchildren could have some land. Would that be worth not smoking weed? Would that be worth not having sex with this whole tonight? Thinking about changing the, the way the earth looks at black women. Imagine 40, man, 100 years from now, they're going to look at black women like the most precious treasures on the planet. Would that stop you from having sex with a hoe tonight? Would that stop you from making another, making any more black women feel like they got to have weave in their hair to be beautiful? Make her feel like she gotta, you know, be a hoe or be on a stripper pole or dress half naked to get attention. Man, I would be willing to do no, I would be willing to give up all of that if 400 years from now my grandchildren had land. Everybody understand. You gotta think, think like stop coming into the truth. You're gonna learn to no longer think about just tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Think about 400 years from now. When when a black man named Jesus Christ, when he gave his life, when he was being beat, being persecuted, when he was carrying that cross. When they was laughing at him and spitting on him. You know what he was thinking about? Sis. The future. The future. He was thinking about 2,000 years. I'm going to have a kingdom. I'm going to rule forever. He took that suffering, took that point. He was thinking, man, my people are going to be, my people going to be able to come back to the Lord now. Those that follow me, they're going to be able to change their lives. They're going to get the power. Brothers that follow me, that's down for me. The Lord going to raise them up and raise our nation back to glory now. It's been 2,000 years. It ain't happened yet. Everybody understand? He was thinking about now. He was thinking about y'all in this room. That's why Christ gave his life. Now, the Lord ain't asking you to give your life. He ain't asking you to die, shed your blood. He's just asking you to stop being a hoe. He asking you to stop being a pimp. Stop loving the white man. Stop getting shape ups. Stop smoking cigarettes. Stop eating pork. Stop eating crabs. Stop celebrating Christmas, no matter how much your kid's going to be mad or feel I left out. Stop celebrating Valentine's Day, no matter how mad your woman gonna be off the whole go leave. The Lord asking you to do something very small, very simple. He ain't asking us to go out there and murder 60 million white people yet. Lord, he ain't requiring you to do that. All the Lord wants you to do is obey him. 
what he's asking us to do to gain something to leave, get to gain a legacy for our children to be able to stand up in and follow is a very small thing. Let's do what the Lord's asking us to do. Everybody understand? All right, let me get on. Um, Finish reading Psalms 10 and 5. So they say the Lord's judgment is far out of his sight. Read on. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He do what? He puffeth at them. Read it again. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. Thanksgiving is the white man puffing at you. It's the white man puffing at the Native American Indians. You understand? The white man celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday is him puffing at you. It's him saying, yeah, nigga, he loved us. He wanted to join us, and we still murdered him. What you going to do? Everybody understand? The white man does all of these things to puff at his enemies, to poke his chest out. What you going to do? Yeah, we murdered the Native Indians and took all their land. Be thankful, nigga. And what do black people do? Praise Jesus and hold hands and let's go around the table and tell everybody what you're thankful for. Everybody understand? He puff up at his enemies. Read on. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. He said what? I shall not be moved. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. That is how the white man feels. The white man don't feel like, the white man feels like he'll never not be in power. Everybody understand? Nobody will ever overtake him or overthrow him. Read on. For I shall be in adversity. For I know. It's like read one more time. For I shall never be in adversity. The white man says to himself, I will never be in adversity. He says to himself, I will never be in adversity. Everybody understand? The white man says, nobody's ever going to have me in slavery. Nobody's ever going to rule over top of me. That's why he's so comfortable being so vicious to us. That's why he's so comfortable <coughs> murdering us, raping us, and then celebrating. Everybody understand? Drop that. Let me. I'm, 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 I'm going to move on. Everybody understand? That's the history of Thanksgiving, right? I got this video I want y'all to see. I'm going to pull the video up. We're going to watch this video. This video is loosely based off of the uh, article that we just read. Let's read it. Um, second, watch this video. All right. <laughs> when a band of English explorers sailed home to England with a ship full of Patuxent Indians bound for slavery. They left behind smallpox, which virtually wiped out those who escaped. By the time the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts Bay, they found only one living Patuxent Indian, a man named Squanto, who had survived slavery in England and knew their language. He taught them to grow corn and to fish and negotiated a peace treaty between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag nation. At the end of the first year, the pilgrims held a great feast honoring Squanto and the Wampanoags. But as the word spread in England about the paradise to be found in the New World, religious zealots called the Puritans began arriving by the boatload. Finding no fences around the land, they considered it to be public domain. Joined by other British settlers, they seized land, capturing strong young natives for slaves and killing the rest. But the Pequot nation had not agreed to the peace treaty Squanto had negotiated, and they fought back. The Pequot War was one of the bloodiest Indian wars ever fought. In 1637, in the present day, Groton, Connecticut, over 700 men, women, and children of the Pequot tribe had gathered for their annual Green Corn Festival, which is our Thanksgiving celebration. In the pre-dawn hours, the sleeping Indians were surrounded by the English and Dutch mercenaries, who ordered them to come outside. 
Those who came out were shot or clubbed to death, while terrified women and children who huddled inside the longhouse were burned alive. The next day, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of Thanksgiving because 700 unarmed men, women, and children had been murdered. Cheered by their victory, the brave colonists and their Indian allies attacked village after village. Women and children over 14 were sold into slavery while the rest were murdered. Boats loaded with as many as 500 slaves regularly left the ports of New England. Bounties were paid for Indian scalps to encourage as many deaths as possible. Following an especially successful raid against the quote in what is now Stamford, Connecticut, the churches announced a second day of Thanksgiving to celebrate a victory over the heathen savages. During the feasting, the hacked off heads of the natives were kicked through the streets like soccer balls. Even the friendly Wampanoag did not escape the madness. Their chief was beheaded and his head impaled on a pole in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where it remained on display for 24 years. The killings became more and more frenzied with days of Thanksgiving feasts being held after each successful massacre. George Washington finally suggested that only one day of Thanksgiving per year be set aside of celebrating each and every massacre. Later, Abraham Lincoln decreed Thanksgiving Day to be a national legal holiday during the Civil War. On the same day, he ordered troops to march against the starving Sioux in Minnesota. The story doesn't have quite the same fuzzy feeling associated with it as the one where the Indians and pilgrims are all sitting down together at a big feast. But we need to learn our true history so it won't ever be repeated. This Thanksgiving, when you gather with your loved ones to thank your creator for all your blessings, think about the people who only wanted to live their lives and raise their families. They also took time out to say thank you for all their blessings. Everybody get that right. So we saw it on Thanksgiving, right? Anybody have any questions? Come on with it. Um, the, the trial they said about um, Massachusetts and um, Connecticut, that mm -hmm. one tribe, well, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember, um, that in the Native Indian found the um the documents to his great great grand grandfather's land. Mm -hmm. He said his grandfather never sold the land. They the way he took the land. Yeah. And he took it to the government and won the case, the Supreme Court. Yeah. He was making everybody tear down all their houses. They had to make a treaty with him. He gave him a whole lot of money. He mm -hmm. won, yeah, he wanted he told everybody in Connecticut and Manchester cut change your house down. Yeah. And nobody went crazy. They don't know, my God, we got a million dollar homes. <laughs> It was yeah. two years ago. Okay, I know her. I'll try to pull it up. Pull it up. Yeah, I'll try to pull it up. See, but the white man, he knows that he's the devil. The problem is we don't know. It, you understand? We continue to try and trust him and want to love him, and that's why we die. Right? When I days I work hard on the job. My manhood. Uh -huh. Hey, black women, y'all got to wait the full.